we're starting recording now. Public school teachers throughout the country are being given a new way to teach. What is this new method and what does it involve? Find out on Talking with Henrietta, coming up next. <music> Hi, I'm Henrietta. Welcome to the show. In my previous show, my guests and I talked about the Common Core Standards a new requirement, educational requirement, as a method of training for public schools throughout the country. On this show, we'll discuss how teachers will be trained using the Common Core Standards and some of the challenges and the expectations that they have. I have three guests on the show. Two are on the set and one will be joining us by Skype. On my left is Lorena Ellis, Lorena Moreno Ellis, who is the Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction in the Ravenswood City School District in East Palo Alto. On my right is Erin Gantz, who is a first grade teacher at the Brentwood Academy in East Palo Alto. She is also a reading um, recovery teacher and a first grade teacher and a leader of teachers. I will also be talking with Deborah Watkins, who is the founder, president, and executive director of the California Alliance of African American Educators. And um, we will talk to her if our Skype connection works. So welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you so you. much for joining me. <laughs> Thank you for that having That was a little here. difficult to get through. <laughs> <laughs> Not a long title. <laughs> yes. Well, anyway, in terms of the Common Core Standards, uh, I mentioned they were mandated in 2009. Correct. So when did they start in the Ravenswood City School District? Uh, it's been ongoing, I would say, for the last three years. I came on board uh, just last year as Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction. And so uh, we've been implementing Common Core uh, with more fidelity in the last two years. Uh, one, by actually aligning our um, professional development so teachers are feeling more comfortable with uh, Common Core. So I had mentioned at the top in a very halting way that you, <laughs> 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 that you are a leader of first grade teachers. Yeah. And so I would assume in your position you've been able to see a lot of uh, reaction yes. from the teachers Definitely. in terms of the Common Core standards. Yeah. And so what type of reactions have you had? Well, I think, you know, in our district, we have a lot of teachers that are really willing and ready to try and do anything to support our students. So I've seen a lot of people just jumping on board with whatever initiative we've been rolling out. Um, all our professional development that we've been trying to offer um, or ones that we've been attending, I think people are kind of looking for what can they gain from going to that professional development, um, what can we gain from working with each other and just really diving into the Common Core. I don't think that's true everywhere. I, I've heard a lot of pushback in other districts and in other areas, other states. Um, this wasn't just adopted in California. The Common Core, you know, is across the nation. So, um, yeah, I think it really varies and it, and it depends on where you're at and what kind of support you have, I think, with, with how people are feeling about it. Deborah, can you hear us? Is hear you, but can, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. We can see you. We'd love to be able to see you. Um, I, I had mentioned, I had asked about the reaction of teachers. What about the reaction of your organization? So the California Alliance of African American Educators has um, a rather simple stance about the Common Core um, standards. And that is that unless children are properly scaffolded, um, they will not be able to to reach those standards. Now, when you talk about scaffolding, what do you mean? 
I mean, provided um, tiered support um, so that they are prepared enough to actually um, meet the standards. Then the standards are more rigorous than they were um, before. And we already have this pernicious gap that won't go away between uh, black and brown students and white and, and most Asian students. And so my organization's position is unless we prepare the children very thoroughly to access the standards, um, they will result in more push outs and more dropouts. So Lorena, you have a, you would like to react to that, obviously. I, I would, and I, I think that really has to do with the professional development that takes place with our teachers. Um, and I would agree that there needs to be a lot of scaffolding even for our teachers because uh, we're going from an era where everything was scripted, uh, where teachers knew exactly what to say by the book, and now we're seeing uh, think outside the box. Uh, be more creative, bring your critical thinking skills, but we have to model. And so one of the initiatives that we have at uh, Ravenswood is to say, look, we need to model the lesson and show you what does it look like in the classroom, not just to come in and give you the paperwork or talk about the theory, but actually walk you through the process so when you go back into the classroom, you're able to implement those strategies. Do you think um, Aaron, that the teachers feel that they're get, getting that support or do they feel comfortable? Yeah, I, I, it really varies. I think once again, that, that word's probably going to keep coming up <laughs> this evening. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's we have new teachers and I think new teachers, it's overwhelming regardless of what standards they were teaching. It's just going to be rough your first year. Um, and I, I just want to clarify too that Ravenswood is in East Palo Alto because my, a lot of people might, might not know where Ravenswood City School District is. Um, so we have a student population that comes in and, and they, there is a lot that there's a disparity between East Palo Alto and Palo Alto and, and what our students come in with and I think that teachers require a lot of support and we talked about BITSA um, recently in our district and we're having an overhaul right now. BITSA is beginning teacher support. It's a program to make sure that teachers feel like they're getting the support they need. Um, and the professional development we're being offered with our district I think is really has improved a lot in the last couple of years too where we're seeing more experts coming in and teaching us about the Common Core and not just about the Common Core because it hasn't been around that long, but <laughs> about how to actually teach reading and how to get them to think critically and how to reason and explain yourself and um, kind of even language acquisition, which is really difficult for our mm -hmm. students. A lot of them are English language learners, like 85% in our school alone. So there's a lot of professional development. I think it, it can just continue to get better. So Deborah, do you hear us? I hear you perfectly. Thank okay, you. and you heard what what uh, Lorena and what Erin had to say. And do you have any reaction? Uh, because you had talked about the necessary support for right. this. Right, and you know, I, I trained as a high school teacher. I went mm -hmm. through the Stanford Teacher Education Program a thousand years ago, uh, <laughs> and when I came out um, in 1977. Um, you know, I was I was determined to reach all children in my high school English classes. Unfortunately, I found that my ninth graders in many cases were reading at fifth and sixth grade level. And um, the grade point average when I started teaching 37 years, 30, almost 38 years ago for black students in the East Side Union High School District in San Jose was 1.5. And when I finished teaching and took an early retirement three years ago, it was 1.9. That is criminal mm -hmm. and obscene. Um, and the reason why the California Alliance takes a rather jaded um, position when it comes to the Common Core standards is because of that kind of data. That's just one district, but I serve on several statewide um, committees looking at the gap. Um, I served on Jack O'Connell's P16 Council. We came up with 14 policy recommendations before he termed out as state superintendent of public instruction, and not one of those policies ever got traction in okay. any of the districts. Um, we'll get back to those uh, 14 recommendations that you just now pointed to. I'm going to give Lorena a chance to respond. And in the meantime, is it possible for us to see you by Skype? Uh, we're looking at Two things, uh, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's, kind of, that's so much <laughs> better. Great. So Lorena, you wanted to make a comment. 
I, I would agree with Deborah that there is a huge achievement gap and we don't have to go very far because we're here in Ravenswood and 70% uh, of our students are English learners. Uh, we have approximately 12% uh, of our students are special ed and then plus we have about 12% African American. So there is a huge gap because when they go to Menlo, Atherton or Sequoia in general, mm -hmm. our students are are falling through the cracks. The graduation rate is fairly low. Um, one of the things that we are uh, moving forward with as a district is to ensure that we are uh, working closely with Sequoia to say how are we going to bring that achievement gap and collaborating with teachers from Sequoia, especially from sixth through eighth grade, to see uh, how can we align the Common Core standards to the high school uh, Common Core standards as well. Um, the other piece that I see is that we need uh, to have those ongoing discussions with both districts because it's the feeder and the assumption that is constantly being made that, you know, well, our children can't learn because they come from a poor environment or uh, the low income um, or uh, students of color. But as teachers, I think having that collaboration time to share ideas and to actually start implementing some of these strategies, we've seen some progress. Are so you had mentioned uh, like teacher attitudes. And I'm just wondering, <laughs> as a teacher working with other teachers, yeah. what type of attitudes do you usually run into? Yeah, you know, I think, well, I can say that something I've seen with the Common Core, something that I think most of us can appreciate, and something I can, I guess, only speak for myself, but um, is that the Common Core, the idea was that we were taking these skills that we felt like were necessary to get students to, to graduate high school, to move into college, and to take that across the, the whole United States, because before the Common Core standards, every state had its own idea of what meant that there was learning success and what proficiency looked like at, in each of those states. So the idea of the Common Core was just to equalize across the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and I can appreciate that working in East Palo Alto, that I, I have these standards that if I can make my child meet those goals, that they hopefully will be successful in second grade then and third and continue on and have the skills necessary to be successful college students That's and high what students. you as a teacher feel. Do you get that feedback from other teachers? Because it's my understanding in some cases, because they do work in a school district like East Palo Alto, they may have kind of come in with certain notions of the learning capacity of their students. Right, I think, I think East Palo Alto, we've been doing an incredible job thinking that our children can succeed and expecting the highest, having, setting the highest expectations for our students. Um, I don't see that in all districts, I don't see that in all states. So, for sure. so is that something that you run into, Deborah? In terms of the all over the added. all over the state of California, um, and I know these are both veteran educators. Um, they know that um, institutional racism is alive and well. Mm -hmm. um, it plays a major role in keeping the gap uh, wide. Um, also, uh, implicit bias. Um, you know, there there are unconscious bias. There are there are there. Are, low expectations, um, the part of teachers who don't believe as this first grade teacher does, <laughs> that all children can learn. I mean, we, we love to have her in all of our, you know, first grade classes around the state. And then we would, you know, not have kids getting to be in high school, not able to read um, at the ninth grade level. Um, so there, there are just a lot of hurdles um, uh, in the in the in the California school system, I'm currently on the accreditation advisory panel for the Commission on Teacher Credentialing, mm. and what we're looking at is um, the rewriting of what teachers um, should be able should know and be able to do. We're we're, we're rewriting the standards, um, and one of the things that we are infusing now, um, one of the one of the concepts is uh, culturally responsive teaching. And I'm sure in a school district like Ravenswood, um, that's probably sort of the norm for them. Um, but I don't know, I'd like to ask that first grade teacher, what happens after they leave your class? Have you all been able to follow those children and see um, whether or not they are 
getting to middle school and high school reading at grade level and and doing math at grade level um yeah. or, or where are they falling apart where, where are they falling back why why does the gap in, in why does it persist one of the assistant the assistant superintendent who's on she mentioned that you know there's a high dropout rate right. um you know often push out rate um for kids coming out of ravenswood and i'm just wondering if you all have done any longitudinal studies about where do the children when do they start stumbling okay deborah let's let's give them a chance you have <laughs> several excellent questions mm -hmm. follow-ups yeah, anyone following up on the first actually graders? we we have follow-up in the sense that uh, as we move forward with common core and now with the local control funding formula for um, our district uh, we're investing in hiring we hire what we call a transition um, coordinator for high school, where there mm -hmm. we're hel it's helping us to help our students succeed as they go into high school. And so one of the things that we are also looking into is working closely with the garden center to see, okay, where how are our students and doing? Now when you say the Gardner Center, the Gardner Center at Stanford it, University? Correct, mm -hmm. to, to start doing more of the research and seeing, okay, how are Ravenwood students moving when they go to Sequoia? Um, we are investing quite a bit of money in bringing more of that awareness through AVID to, um, to ensure that our students are well prepared. And what's AVID? Oh gosh. Um, it's advancement via individual determination. Thank you very <laughs> much, Deborah. I just went blank. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so ensuring that, you know, we have avid electives and that's opening doors for many of our students so they could start looking into colleges. And the follow-up she had asked in terms of follow-up, first grade, have you had a chance? Let's see, you've been there, I think you said Six for years in East Palo Alto, seven years teaching. So um, some of my students are now, I taught second grade first, so they're in eighth grade now. Um, and I think one of the biggest gaps we see in East Palo Alto is, as Lorena was speaking about, from middle school specifically to high school. Um, and I don't, I haven't done any kind of longitudinal study that's not in my capacity as a first grade teacher as far as getting those numbers. Um, from keeping up with my own students, I like to check in with them often because the middle school that a lot of them go to is right behind my school at the elementary school level, so it's really great to continue to see them and meet with the family. I've, I've heard, and so this is hearsay, <laughs> that with in the high school level, um, because there's a lot of students that aren't able to be redesignated as non-English learners anymore, that they're, they're fully learned the language enough, have enough language acquisition. Um, when they move to high school, they're still taking certain courses that they have to take as English language learners, which means that they might not be able to take the same coursework that would get them to be competitive in a college level setting. So, so are you satisfied, uh, Deborah, with what you've heard, or you have? Actually, can I add to yes. what Erin is saying? When, it, and when we're talking about English learners, and we have 70% of our population in Ravenswood that are considered English learners um, students, what we are trying to do is to bring that awareness to our parents, so our parents are being more proactive. What does mm. it mean to be an English learner, and what does the California English Language Development Test entail? Because a lot of our kids are not taking this test very serious. And one of the changes that I've seen and in my work being in education for 18 years is that if we're not working collaboratively with our parents and bringing that awareness, you're not gonna create that change. So we've been very proactive in bringing that information to the parents to say, okay, what is Common Core and what does it look like? What type of questions should you be asking your teachers? But not only that, become familiar of the assessments. What type of assessments are our kids yeah. gonna be taking out? We're talking about smarter balance. And so bringing that awareness and praising our students for being successful, it's, gonna, it's starting to change the mentality. You mentioned smarter balance. Before we get to you, Deborah, let me just make a follow-up. You said some of the students aren't taking it seriously. Why would it? Why would the students not be taking it seriously? I, I'm, when I'm speaking more is about the California English Language Development Test, because yes. and that's actually a test that has been given to a second language learner. When you step into a, a U.S. school and you speak another language other than um, English or don't speak any English, uh, you're automatically classified as an English learner. So why, 
How is it that the students would not be taking that Because they don't quite understand. A lot of our kids end up in remedial classes. A lot of our, our students are not familiar with the system. Um, we have been very proactive in the sense that we are bringing that awareness to our parents to what does A through G requirements mean and how can my child be attending a four-year college or a two-year college or vocational school as, you know, once they uh, graduate from high school, but what steps do they need to take as early as kindergarten or first grade? Sure. Now, Deborah, you've you've heard some of the responses. Would you have any uh, responses of your own? Well, I'm happy to hear that um, Ravenswood is engaging its parents. Um, as a veteran teacher, uh, I work. Oh dear. Years, You're breaking um, up. <laughs> before I took early retirement three years ago. Yes, and um, I feel that, um, okay, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. There we go. Hello? Yes, okay. we can hear you. Yeah, I was just saying that I'm glad I'm glad to hear the assistant superintendent um, say that um, they're working with parents because that's, that's critical. The, the work I do has always engaged parents and uh, helping them um, become you know, um, the best advocates for their children is one of the most important um, roles uh, a, mm -hmm. an educator can play. Now, you mentioned working on the credentialing of teachers. So have those standards changed over the years? And, and what do you see in terms of teachers now um, coming into the system? Well, the last time I checked, uh, Latino students were 52% of the K through 12 population in California, and so there has there has to be um, in, intentional um, support for those children. Many of them are English language learners, and so um, there 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 have been revisions of the standards. I don't know how often the standards are revised. This is the first time I've been on this end uh, mm -hmm. of the standards work. But um, I think the major, what I'm seeing that's really different is, as I pointed out earlier, an emphasis on what's called culturally responsive instruction or culturally responsive teaching. And um, that's where uh, teachers are trained in schools of education uh, um, to pay attention to the whole child and realize um, that the child brings prior knowledge uh, and experiences to the educational table, um, and those should not be denigrated. Uh, they should not be, um, you know, uh, um, put down in any way, but rather celebrate it because mm -hmm. they make up the whole child. Okay, so let's talk about that in terms of culturally sensitive uh, training. What's going on as far as teachers are concerned? Yeah, you know, because I'm most of them, a lot of them in the Ravenswood City School District. Uh, don't live in the city right. and live in other areas. Definitely. I, you know, I, I think Deborah was saying too that she, how often the standards have, have changed. And so I'm not sure if they've even changed since when I was in school because I just got my credential, you know, seven years ago. Um, and a lot of the coursework I took being in California specifically too, there is a lot about um, institutionalized racism, what we can look for as far as um, the whole child approach to teaching and and thinking about that our students are coming in with these amazing strengths and abilities that everybody has a different set of of background knowledge and where they're coming from as far as their income levels and um, looking at the child and, and thinking that they can't achieve and I know Deborah was saying that you know that might not be true in everywhere and it's not necessarily true all throughout California she works with more districts it sounds like clearly <laughs> than um, I do so I, I think there's there. Well, that's the theory. Uh, yeah. The, the yeah. amazing students, but when it comes right down to the uh, in the classroom, is there that feeling? These are amazing students. They bring all of these talents. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, Our showcases, I think, are great with the, with reaching out with the families. Well, and that. I and I have to applaud uh, Deborah for actually incorporating the culturally responsive into the you know standards, teaching cre yeah. credential standards because I went I went through the. 
multicultural center back in Sacramento State University, and so we had that training. And I can honest, honestly say that that really made a difference in me as a teacher because I was able to connect with every child regardless of their race, color, or you know, ethnic background. Give us an example of what that training entailed. Uh, that training entailed um, respect, tolerance, uh, honoring children's background, and, and also bringing multicultural uh, literature into the classroom that children were able to relate to. So I went through the era where open court was in full influx and we had the scripted uh, program. But for me it was, I couldn't reach all of my children. So I would always, and I was using this earlier with Erin, um, I would supplement materials. So if we were reading a story, um, you know, usually, let me give you the example of February, it's uh, African American month, right? How do we bring that literature into our children's hands? And how do we compare and contrast to other leaders who have created change in our systems? And let me tell you, what I saw is that children loved reading once they were able to connect to something that came from their background. So it really makes a difference. Um, I'm really happy and I hope that happens because that will yeah. make a difference in our educational system. And I would agree that yes, we do have teachers who still push back because that's not my job. But how do we bring that as leaders at the district level? And um, I've been blessed to be working with Dr. Hernandez, who is um, Dr. Hernandez Goff, who's who a, a superintendent. <laughs> superintendent of uh, Ravenswood and ha believes in every child and has allowed me to be creative in my job and also think outside the box. So let's talk about some challenges. And I don't know if you can stay with us for the whole time, Deborah, but. Um, under some circumstances, I think you had mentioned in, in, that uh, some students might be doing even worse under the Common Core Standards. Mm. Uh, what, what circumstances would that involve? Well, again, I'm, I'm concerned about those students who were not able to access the standards before Common Core was introduced. And so those were the students who were that we read about all the time that are, you know, far below basic, below basic. Um, they're not at proficiency. Um, and so that's the group I'm always concerned about because if they weren't meeting the standards before, and now these are more rigorous, these are requiring critical thinking skills. Um, you know, there was even an article that talked about, you know, the, the, um, the technology skills that kids need now yeah. because like smarter balance tests and the park test, yeah. you know, those are all based on computers. I mean, they have exactly. to be able to use computers. And so there might be some, some issues around kids who are, and it's hard to believe that there might be kids growing up in, into this day and age that are not proficient in computer use, but right. nonetheless, there might be some. So, yes, I think um, a lot of them in the Ravenswood City School District. <laughs> we don't have to go very far because yes. we do have those in Ravenswood. And one of the challenges, and it was actually appalling to me, uh, Deborah, coming to this district, I worked in the Central Valley for many years. Um, but coming here and knowing that we're in the heart of the Silicon Valley and we didn't right. have, yes. we didn't have exactly. enough computers for our kids. So let me tell you, we mm -hmm. had to spend um, half of our Common Core money just to ensure that every right. child well, had at least, you know, yeah. one, we're two, still buying we're technology, still buying technology computers but and ensuring that they had computers yeah. to be able to compete with the SBAC. Um, the other challenge that, that I, I see is having the technology that works effectively. <laughs> and again, I, I'm shocked because this is happening here in the... <laughs> right, in, right, in, right in the vicinity of Yahoo and it's, Google and Facebook. Right. And yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Challenges you find with first graders. Well, the con technology, you know, there's a lot of studies that show that they shouldn't necessarily learn typing right away in first grade, so we haven't been working with that yet. But just giving them the exposure to technology in general, I think, has been one of our first steps as far as getting them anywhere close to being competent on computers before they have to take the Smarter Balance test in third grade. 
Um, I'm also thankful, by the way, that the test has now moved from second grade is when they first had to take the test to now third okay. grade. So that makes me a little bit happier. Um, you know, something that I was just thinking about when I was hearing both of these wonderful women speak was uh, about not only the standards, but how we're teaching those standards. Because the idea of the Common Core also was that the standards were simplified um, and that states were supposed to take 90% of the Common Core, but then do about 10% of whatever standards they felt like were important. Um, and I was just at a big conference in Ohio for reading recovery teachers and Mary Freed, who's worked with Mari Clay that kind of started reading recovery in the United States. Um, she spoke about that she feels like teachers also need to be giving that 10%. Like what is your 10% that you're giving that makes your classroom different, that's supporting your students, that um, you're the one who starts to know your class the best. And so I think one of the biggest challenges for Common Core is, I mean, believing in our students is, is first, of course, and, but then after that is, is how do I get my, my children speaking um, so that they can dive deeply into these standards. And a lot of the standards have been simplified in certain ways. It's just how we talk about those things. It's not just saying two plus two is four. It's how did I know that two plus two is no, four? No, the Common Core standards are uh, required in terms of English and math. That's mm -hmm. where the biggest changes are. Yes. Now, Erin just now mentioned 10%. Teachers must use the Common Core standards 90% and then 10% they're on their own to do what they want? I, it's thinking more outside the box. You see more project-based learning where um, it's not just like Erin was saying, here's a worksheet, but how did you solve that problem? So being more um, creative, uh, but also allowing students to to be able to uh, analyze and, and use their crit critical thinking skills uh, to get to solve that problem. Um, uh, one of the challenges that I see through Common Core too is that we are moving so fast into Common Core, but I don't think the state was prepared mm. to with the materials. Um, uh, the Common Core, give you an example, the new uh, science. Uh, uh, NGS. Uh, NGS. Uh, the new, gen next generation science Next generation standards, yeah. science mm -hmm. standards. Right. They just yeah. came out um, this year, but materials are not well developed yet. So teachers are saying, okay, we're ready to move in that direction, but provide me with all the materials. So it seems, as, as always in any classroom, a lot of the responsibility is on the teacher. Yeah. And the better the teacher, the better the classwork and the, the, the more the student can advance. Yeah, so true. it seems that this is even harder for teachers. Teachers have to do much more. So. Uh, there, there's been a lot of talk about teachers being incompetent, and so what mm. happens when you have even teachers who are really incompetent with the Common Core? Deborah. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately my battery's running low, so I'm going to probably have to sign off in a few minutes. Um, but it's been it's been great. Thank you, uh, um, Ms. Henrietta, for inviting uh, me to um, share my perspective. I would say that. Um, you know, it's like police officers, right? There are good cops and there are bad cops. And there are good teachers and there are bad teachers. Um, you know, I think every profession has its share of good and bad. Um, unfortunately, teachers get a really bad rap, <laughs> um, you know, because you know, um, it's easy to blame us. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's see, yeah, exactly. We're easy yeah. targets, you yeah. know. And I say we still, even though I haven't been in the classroom, you know, I, I left the classroom a number of years ago, even before I retired. I still think with a teacher's hat on, um, because that's how I started in the profession. Um, and you know, ironically, I, I I'm on the uh, executive board for the collaborative for reaching and teaching the whole child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh dear, the battery's going. And we had our board meeting this morning. Yeah, we had our board meeting this morning and we were talking about how difficult it is for teachers to do everything that people want them to do. It's really hard. And, you know, unless you've ever, you know, in my case, I had 150 kids, you know, a, a, you know, a year, right? Five classes times, you know, 30. Um, in the, the, the case of the elementary school teachers, you know, they have 30, 35 kids. You know, when I worked for Partners in School Innovation, I took a leave of absence from my district for a year and worked for them. I worked with the elementary school principals at three schools in the, the San Jose area, and I was just mm -hmm. awed 
by the, the elementary school teachers because I get the kids when they know how to read already. But the fact that they are responsible for those children learning how to read, put sentences together and make sense of it, that is an awesome responsibility. And my biggest concern is what happens to the children along the way. Why is it that so many of them stumble and fall? And I haven't heard you know anyone on the show yet from Ravenswood talk about you know what happens you know what can we do to protect these children along their pathway from kindergarten to 12th grade so that they don't end up a dropout statistic or on the school to prison pipeline yeah. what can we do so so Deborah thank you so much your your battery was kind of we could tell it's on its way out. <laughs> and, uh, just let us know when you're leaving us, and uh, we will continue with that question. Yeah. What is being done to assist the, to make sure the teacher, the tr children, don't fall through the cracks? I think one of the well, I hate saying anything. <laughs> A problem I see in our district is the summer slip, we, we call it. I don't know, if that's probably not a technical term. But uh, what happens when they go home and then they're not every day with the same structure, looking at the same literature, looking, having the same kind of conversations that we're trying to push them, that rigor that we're pushing now at the Common Core. Um, and we see, I mean, I have students that when they leave kindergarten are using a certain uh, reading level assessment, are testing it right on track, like end of kindergarten grade level on track, and then I test them at the beginning of first grade and they've dropped two levels. Two well, levels that happens the, the with ten. all students, I would think, across the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unless they're given whatever Summer they school or something yes. too. Unless you know? they're yeah, we, given we that, call yeah. that. Yeah, we call that summer learning loss. Summer and learning uh, loss. that is a real phenomenon. It really yeah. is. And, you know, and here's, here's where that gap comes in. So, you know, parents of means, uh, middle class parents and above, they can put their kids in summer camps. Summer they can put them, you know, they can take them to the museum. They can take them to, you know, the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They can keep their brains active in the summer. Whereas parents who are barely paying their rent or barely paying their mortgage exactly. and, you know, working long hours. Or three jobs. You know, yeah, 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 or exactly. three jobs. You know, their kids might be at the Boys and Girls Club, and I'm not knocking the Boys and Girls Club, but they might be there all day, and most of what they do is play sports. You know, there isn't a lot of academic enrichment going on at a Boys and Girls. I'm not saying, you know. Well, in, in the in East every Palo Alto, that uh, culture Menlo is Park, changing. Yes, they they they're, they are doing a lot that's they academic, are. enriching on computers. So one of the things that I have to say, we it's building those partnerships and working with the Boys right. and Girls Club, for for example, is we've been partnering up to uh, bring some of the training that is also uh, coming from curriculum and instruction. Um, I, I would agree with you, uh, Deborah, and that was part of my observation as an assistant superintendent last year when I went to see some of these after school, there was more of a babysitting place. Mm -hmm. And I said, we need to come together because our kids are losing instructional time, but how are we engaging them? So we are focusing on bringing STEM through the after school program, science, uh, science through after school, uh, computer labs, uh, activities, sports as well. So it's, it's a combination of, of both. Um, the other piece that we are focusing in is bringing more um, the literacy initiative because we see that a lot of our students actually, Ravenswood is the lowest uh, district in the San Mateo County Office of Education in terms of literacy. So we're focusing on bringing stronger teachers to kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and third grade. So let us also say not only is it the lowest in San Mateo County, but it's one of the lowest in the state of California. Exactly, and so so that's part of the, the rigor that we're putting into effect. Um, having the local control funding um, plan in place too has given us some flexibility um, to utilize some of those funds and in a way that we're reaching every child at Ravenswood. So Deborah, I think, has gone, and yeah, we right. really appreciate her participation. I'd like to get back to that question in terms of the responsibility of the teachers, because it seems now under Common Core, the teacher has even more responsibility and even more work in terms of 
um, presenting information. Yes, definitely. It, it's not just uh, this is the guideline, and right. so we'll follow the guidelines. Right. right. The teacher has to go beyond the guideline mm -hmm. and put a lot of his or her own creativity yeah. in the work that's being done. Exactly. So what assurances, what's being done to motivate the teachers? Um, currently, uh, the other piece that we have put in place for Ravenswood is having um, coaching for our teachers. Mm -hmm. um, we, I just, as a matter of fact, I just met with our first and second year teachers because they have to finish the bits of program uh, in order for them to be fully credentialed. And so what, what we are doing is assigning them to a mentor that is um, connected to their subject area. So we have teachers who are music teachers. So what I've asked of other teachers who are already veteran teachers in that area to be their mentors, their coaches. Um, same thing for single subject. When, when I say single subject, I'm referring more to the sixth through eighth grade teachers because their focus is more on language arts or science or So math. where does this coach come from? And would a teacher feel some way or other that that says something about their skills. Maybe they aren't quite qualified or they're not good yeah. enough or they're not capable, that they need extra coaching themselves. I, I don't think so. I think it's how we are approaching it. We do have a partnership with the new Teacher Center of, of Santa Clara. And so basically they they take them under their wing. They model for them. They uh, work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, one of the things that I see and I think it's been very effective is that they take time to listen to their concerns too mm -hmm. before they, you know, uh, and what I mean, um, their concerns, you know, teachers may say, well, I'm really good at doing a language arts lesson, but I'm struggling with science. What can you do to provide me that support? So do you think that the teachers will be honest in terms of where they may feel deficient, thinking that if they admit that, that somehow that might be held against them? Something that's really, I think, beautiful about education and educators is that we, a, a lot of us really believe in, in ongoing learning and mm -hmm. that we're lifelong learners. We try to instill that in our students. So I, I think that a lot of people are really reflective. And, and at my school, I know we're given a lot of time to be reflective. We work with our colleagues. We try to do observations. We can see each other. Um, and the district has now been working really hard on changing up the kind of professional development we could get to. We can choose a strand that we feel like we need some support in, or maybe we want more guidance. Um, we want to hear someone who's been doing it longer than us, or um, you know, just some other ideas, get a new fresh look in something. So being given choice, I think that allows people to feel like they're, they're coming from a place of, I know my strengths, I know where I want some extra support, and it doesn't feel like you're being told that you're incapable or, or that you, you don't have the ability to do something. So there are always misconceptions with anything. What might be some of the misconceptions with the Common Core Standards? Um, gosh, uh, that it's, I think some of those misconceptions is that we're not ready for it, and I think it, it's a paradigm shift uh, from going from a scripted program now to more critical thinking, uh, more hands-on, um, also undermining our teachers because I think a lot, mm -hmm. uh, and I can honestly say as, as a teacher that I was, I think a lot of the times we don't give credit to our teachers. And they're great at what they do, but believing in them too, and providing them that ongoing support and saying, you know, we're here as a team. Um, one of the things that I constantly uh, was hearing when I came to this district is the district. And to me is, we are the district, regardless of who you are. Do the teachers feel that they're a part of the team? That there is a I team? Most of the time they do, yes. Most <laughs> of the time. <laughs> I think we're all working really hard, and uh, we're all working really, really, really hard to get and our I, students And I don't there blame want. teachers because they were um, in an era where uh, they were told or they, they felt Definitely. being um, they punished for not being on the right page, for not teaching. Um, so I... I <laughs> Let us hope there will be no teachers who feel that they're being punished, unless Definitely. they deserve yeah. to be punished. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to thank good. the two of you for yes. being here to share what's going on in terms of Common Core Standards with the preparation of the teachers. Thank you. So I. <laughs>
<laughs> Come you. back anytime. I'd certainly like to thank our viewers for watching. Until next time. <laughs>